more info. The studio is a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology with everything from comedy to coding and product development to performance art. We're a partnership between the Watershed, the University of the West of England and the University of Bristol and we're a home for early stage ideas, new companies and we're a meeting place for both the creative and commercial industries. We're a studio space and we offer desk space, meeting rooms, event spaces and opportunities all for free to our residents. Ultimately, we are a safe place for artists to take risks in their practice and make time for collaboration. For this week's talk, we are joined by Katie Connor as part of her spring residency at the Watershed. Katie has been exploring hydroponics, the art and science of growing plants in a liquid water medium. In this lunchtime talk, Katie will share stories from her residency where she's established several new hydroponic systems in her studio at Spike Island, which you're going to see in a minute, and it looks lush. There's going to be a Q&A at the end with the talk running at roughly 35 minutes. Um, if you want to ask any questions, just pop them into the chat and I'll pick them out as we go. Feel free to say hello to each other in the chat as well. You can tweet questions to us at PM Studio UK on Twitter and please feel free to share the link now on any of your socials. A captioned and recorded version of this talk will be available here after the talk is finished, just like it is every week. Before we start, next week's talk is soon to be announced. Uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, we've had to push Tiny Giant's talk on NFTs back to a later date, but we will announce a new date for that soon, so don't, you're not going to miss out. And in the meantime, you can get news on all our future talks by heading to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio, following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter, or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or by subscribing to the newsletter on our website. Don't forget, while you're sat there, hit subscribe on this YouTube channel and give us a thumbs up. The more likes we get, the more subscribers we get, the more we can share stories like this. Now, I'm going to hand over to Katie Connor. Hi. Um... Thank you for coming today. Um, my name is Katie Connor. I'm a white woman wearing glasses and a black and white shirt. I have silver hair and a short fringe. And I'm sitting in the studio here at Spike Island where I've established um, a number of hydroponic systems that you can see behind me. Um, so, yeah. Um, so today I'm going to give you a little introduction to the practice that I've been doing. Um, since March, and I'll describe what I did in terms of some of the um, experiments. And um, I will talk about some of the sort of broader aspects of the project, and then I'll talk about the sort of future plans that I have for um, the next sort of six, six to 12 months. Um, so before um, I started this project, and um, actually before lockdown, I had a residency at Bristol Bio at Bristol University, which is the research centre for synthetic biology, where I spent time in a biomedical research lab. And here they were growing um, cells, blood cells in a nutrient liquid media. And um, that got me thinking about our relationship to nature and technology and how sort of synthetic or highly technologized would become not only in terms of handling nature, but also redesigning it. Um, so I'm showing a picture here of um, some jars and um, Petri dishes that are growing these um, blood cells. And here is an image of the red blood cells um, through a microscope. So, um, this, these sort of thoughts um, fed into my ideas for the for the residency and working with hydroponics, but also um, lockdown 2020, I ended up spending a lot of time in my uh, Bristol allotment and reflecting not only on the residency, but on the kind of um, how sort of precarious our access to fresh food had become on the difficulties of growing fresh food. Um, in the context of lockdown, but also in the context of wider sort of political um, issues such as uh, Brexit, supply chains, and I realised how um, how many of our sort of uh, fresh food were imported from the EU, um, and there seemed to be a big shift indeed between like this dyna dynamic that we had um, sort of. It, when allotments were, were established, you know, the dig for victory sort of push for people to grow their own um, fruit and vegetables and the sort of contrast with, with the sort of belittling of the welfare state in the current political climate. So these kind of all sort of um, percolated and got me to kind of think about um, hydroponics. And um, yeah, these are some of the sketches that I was doing around that time around sort of sprouting 
seeds and the sort of similarities between um, seeds and, and cells. So um, hydroponics. So hydroponics is used um, very much, um, it's, it's used a lot in large scale agriculture and particularly in um, countries such as the Netherlands um, where these photographs were taken by Luca Locatelli. Um, in large indoor greenhouses um, where cultivation on this sort of scale is a, is a data driven exercise. So here there's a lot of use of robotics, the use of sensors um, and responding to the kind of needs of plants, but mostly in a very instrumentalized fashion, um, growing the most productively um, in highly automated environments. So the, the temperature and the humidity and the light are very much controlled in terms of what is desired from the particular crops. Um, there's a sense in which the, these are much more controlled systems. So there's a, there's a predictability to the growth and they're not um, seasonal. They can be grown all year round in, in, in systems that are heated and that have LED light sources. Um, so what, what I was interested in doing in the studio was setting up a number of very kind of small scale, small scale systems of, um, of hydroponics. And this is a kind of a very simple kind of diagram of what um, hydroponics is. So it's it's growing um, seeds, growing um, crops in a in a media that is not soil based at all. So it's a substrate such as rock wool or um, foam or like a sponge. Um, and then um, it's suspended, usually suspended over a sort of nutrient liquid media, which is water based um, and will have um, the nutrients or the chemicals added into that, which are um, tailored for um, the different plants. So um, there might be different mixes for different crops. Um, <clears throat> and also the, the pH level of that nu nutrient media is monitored. So it's, it's, it's seen as like the ideal, um, the ideal kind of content that the plants would need. And rather than the roots having to, to um, source those things in the soil, um, these, these um, chemicals in the water is, is readily available for the plants to take as they need. So, um, yeah, I was very kind of interested in in these as in this as a kind of um, a fresh um, way to source um, food. Um, to there's many systems that are suitable for kind of kitchen surfaces, and the idea is that these are kind of fresh. Um, they're vitamin rich. They don't. Um, they're not packaged. They don't have to travel um, miles um, to get to the supermarket. So um, what I've set up in the studio is um, some very kind of simple systems. I don't know if you can see them here. Um, so I've got a couple of um, tabletop systems uh, here. This one is, is growing sage. I'll come to that in a bit. Uh, and then we've got a um, smaller system, a larger system underneath the desk here. And then uh, this is the largest system. And these have all been growing since um, April this year. So um, this image is of a seedling. Um, it's been, it's, it's grown in rock wool. Um, which is soaked in this kind of nutrient media. So the rock wool is a, is a sterile uh, media, but it's not at all like soil. So it has no nutrient um, value whatsoever. It's just a means of supporting the plants as they grow and a means to like absorb the nutrient media. Um, so what I started to do was like uh, initiated some of these um, crops in the smaller um, sort of, um, kitchen or surface um, boxes and um, they're, they're sort of like off the shelf um, systems so they they come um, readily um, sort of packaged with the LED lights and um, a, a sort of container 
or a kind of chamber which holds, these hold five liters of water. And then um, they're on a timer so that the plants get like the adequate light that they need, but they also get a rest period as well overnight. Um, and then there's a pump as well as part of this whole kind of system. There's a built-in pump that aerates the, um, the roots and enables the, the roots to have air as well as the, um, as well as the nutrient media. So these are some examples of, of seedlings grown. There's some cucumber plants. Um, there's some spinach. And there's also some tomatoes here. And then the, the nice thing about hydroponics is that you can pull these chambers out. So you can pull the pots out of the, the chamber and then you're able to see the kind of root growth as it, as it establishes. And then this is much later where um, I've grown quite a lot of different sort of salad crops um, in the studio. So there's some rocket here, there's some basil, there's some chard. Um, and then at the front of the image, you can see um, all of those sort of greens that have grown over that period of time. So um, as well as setting up these small systems, uh, I set up this uh, much larger system, which is a 25 liter chamber. Um, and this is more of a modular system. So it's got a separate pump, um, it's got a separate chamber, and then the lights are, um, are kind of, um, yeah, they're, they're separate again. Um, so I found that with the um, smaller systems, although they're easy to buy, they're off the shelf, if one um, bit breaks, so if the pump breaks, then obviously the whole system is, um, is vulnerable. And um, so the, the larger systems, these are more for kind of people grow much larger crops at home. So they're not so much for the domestic market, but more like specialist growers. Um, and in this system, I've got um, a tomato, again, um, and cucumbers, and a pepper. And this is another point of view of these systems. And you can see here that the, um, this is the rock wall, but they're, they're much larger cubes. And again, they're soaked in the media. And then underneath, um, there is a pump that pumps the, the water past the, the rock wall, so it's continually flowing. Uh, so there's a continual aeration of the, of the roots. And then these are, there's some grow lights over the top of those as well. And this is uh, the plants uh, getting bigger. And also this is um, some uh, small systems that I set up because I was very aware that there's a lot of plastic used in, in these kind of hydroponic chambers. I was quite interested in setting up much smaller um, sort of passive systems. So there's no pumps in these, but they're reusing and recycling um, sort of yogurt pots or water bottles. And the idea was to, for them to be possibly um, on a kitchen windowsill. So I've got lettuce here on, um, in, the, in the water bottles. And then there's also a number of, there's a couple of different pepper plants as well that are still growing in those systems. So it's like, I was just trying to think about different ways in which to approach and to appropriate these kind of methods and make them more like accessible for people so they don't have to spend 70 pounds on a, on a, um, a setup or a kit. And this is one of the flowers growing on the pepper plants in, in these, they're called cracky um, pots. And then this um, system, this is the largest system. So this is called an ebb and flow. It's 120 litres of water, um, which is contained in a chamber um, below what you see here. Um, and then that um, is pumped um, up to the second chamber that you can see here, which is covered in a kind of media of clay pebbles. So they will hold the roots in place of the tomato plants. So the, I planted, um, I transplanted tomato plants when they got to a certain size into this um, system. And so this is the, the system here that you can see um, full of the tomato plants. 
And this was taken um, probably a couple of weeks ago. Um, so you can see that the, the tomatoes have, um, have basically gone a bit wild, gone a bit feral. Um, with, with this kind of process, what I was trying to do was not to think about, you know, in the kind of against the grain of thinking about hydroponics as a very instrumentalized sort of, um, way of um, growing produce, I really wanted to experiment and see how the plants would respond to this, these settings and these environments. So um, with the tomatoes, I know that you are, um, as a grower, you're supposed to pinch out the, the growing stems. But what I was more interested in, certainly at this stage, as a kind of experimental first first go or proof concept was to kind of just see what, what would happen. I was very interested in thinking about what might happen to the plants as they as they grew and, and if they could actually grow from seed. Because when I started, I had no idea whether or not this would work. So these have all been grown from seed in the studio. And um, I think they were, these ones were um, germinated at the end of April. So that's five months worth of of crazy growth. And um, this is another image that was taken not so long ago. And here you can see again that the um, both the, the nutrient film um, box at below um, and the one at the top, um, the plants have completely sort of um, grown outside of the um, boxes in which they're kind of supposed to be maintained. So again, I was really interested in like, well, just let them grow and see what happens. And one of the cucumber plants um, grew as a vine around a microphone stand that I also had in the studio. So um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit now about um, how I um, wanted to kind of expand upon hydroponics. So think about hydro, rather than hydroponics, think about hydropoetics as a kind of more experimental and expanded um, system. And part of that was also thinking about how I could, um, how I could sort of document these, the, the processes of, in which the, the plants are growing. Um, so what we have here is a, um, what, what I wanted to do was like work with a, um, a filmmaker, uh, Matt Davis, um, to capture the, the, the way that the plants grow um, when we use, we work together on a 60 millimeter film as a kind of time lapse to, um, because there's a lot of processes that are um, just invisible to, to the human kind of perception on, on how these uh, plants are kind of growing in the space. Um, so we set up a um, 60 millimeter um, time lapse. So there was one frame captured every five minutes. So um, each second of film is roughly kind of two hours of real time. So um, Martin, if you want to kind of play the film extract. So I don't know if you can see, but in the top right hand corner of the film, there's a kind of lasso um, motion of the cucumber tendrils as it's kind of um, sensing its environment and uh, trying to find something in which to kind of hold on to. And we've done a number of these plant studies. This is just the, the first initial kind of plant study, um, looking at these kind of this, the sort of sensing modalities of, um, of the cucumber and, and other plants, but this is like more, more visually kind of obvious.
Okay. So that's just like the first initial plant study that we've um, that we that we've done. But we've done a series of like um, five of these now, which which show the plants getting bigger. Um, I was interested in using the bolex as well, just as a kind of um, in contrast to to the hydroponics. Hydroponics is a system. Um, certainly, the way that we think about it now, the way it's presented, is um, seen as highly sort of technological, whereas actually um, it has a much a much kind of longer history. It has a, a very ancient history. In fact, um, it's thought that the hanging gardens of Babylon were kind of forms of hydroponic systems of, or aquaculture, and that's from the seventh century BC. So I'm like really interested in thinking about other ways in which we can um, conceptualize or kind of frame or um, just kind of think about these forms of, of growing that aren't um, are maybe quite so um, technologized as we think. So um, ways in which that I wanted to do that was like introduce sort of different materials in which to kind of disrupt thinking about the systems in this way. So like in some of the systems when I, um, in, in the um, studio, but also when I'm exhibiting them, um, I'm like using um, like pebbles or fossils to kind of um, bringing those into the system. So like thinking about um, both them in terms of like watery, watery systems, but also in terms of like um, older forms of, of, um, of agriculture or, or just in, in terms of like coexisting with plants. Um, and the same with thinking about the ebb and flow um, system, which is the large sort of 120 litre system, thinking about in that, in, because it's a kind of tidal movement that takes the water up to the pebbles and then drops down again. I was thinking about specifically in relation, there's a, there's a tidal river like directly outside the studio, um, Cumberland Basin, and this has the highest tidal range in the world, sorry, the second highest tidal range in the world. So I was like trying to think about ways in which we can kind of um, think about or conceptualize or just simply kind of coexist in a different way potentially with these kind of um, water-based, watery systems. Um, and thinking about um, sort of, ways that go back to sort of more ancient times or more ancient ways of planting seeds, um, thinking about them in relation to um, the moon, for example, like biodynamic um, processes, um, plant seeds on a new moon. So I was thinking about, well, could I do that here with um, some of the systems that I have? Um, and also the way in which um, sort of certainly hydroponics are marketed to um, to uh, sort of growers, um, it's very much around a kind of turbocharged fertilizers and, you know, they're conceptualized in the same way um, as cars might be about power and control. Um, one of the tools that I need to use to measure the electroconductivity of the, um, of the media is um, an EC reader. Um, and this is marketed as a truncheon um, so I was really interested in well, why would you why would you think about that as a as a kind of weapon? So I've renamed it as a wand um, because it has like these different sort of associations and um, linking to kind of more ancient sort of um, magical processes of nature and thinking about water itself as an aspect of enchantment. Um, so as part of that, I was interested um, to like capture this time lapse using a bolex because, I mean, a, a, we think of a bolex as a, as a kind of um, very outdated now and outmoded form of technology, um, but actually the, the bolex and the and hydroponics as we know them today sort of coexisted around the same time. Um, in World War II, um, that's when hydroponics started to be used in non-arable sort of um, places. Um, I think it was a, an island in the Pacific um, where US troops were stationed and they needed to grow crops. So they started to use hydroponics more extensively. And of course, in, your, in World War II, that's when um, the, the bolex was used as a kind of portable, um, a portable means of, of, um, of capturing and documenting um, some of the sort of wartime 
um, uh, sort of activities or, or for propaganda or, or whatever. So, so although we think of like um, this, this kind of film as, as very old, it, there is a sort of uh, a coexistence there in terms of these technologies. So I was very interested to kind of reflect on that by using um, as part of a way to document. And um, another thing that I've been doing in the studio is, is this is, uh, I've been doing some kind of automatic drawings, which um, are made a, through a kind of chance process, a, a meditative process where I don't um, actually see the drawings that I'm making. So these are all uh, like a chalk on a Canford black paper. And it's sort of using a sort of framework in which um, the shapes sort of follow more of a kind of chance procedure. Um, I, I don't see at all the, the um, drawings until they're finished. Um, but what I was really interested in, in terms of what I've emer what's emerged through these is some of the similarities between the, the forms of growth that the plants, um, the, the seeds are making or the, the plants are making and some of the shapes that appear um, on the, um, on the paper. So that sort of, from that, I started to think about the, the way we are kind of coexisting or certainly like coexisting in this space and thinking about the plants themselves as more like sensory beings, that there is a kind of an interrelationship um, that we all have, I think, when we, we have plants in our, in our homes or we go to the allotment, but thinking about, um, hydropoetics maybe as a way to reflect on this way that we live with plants and plants as um, as a sensory beings that where they where they're kind of using the tendrils or the leaves or the roots to respond to these um, environments and thinking about that as a, as a kind of reciprocal relationship um, Yeah, I just wanted to say as well, like in, in regards to this, that um, thinking about sort of the, these aspects of the climate crisis, um, the, the way that the, the methods of documentation through drawing and through filming um, sort of opened out a, a different sort of approach to working with the plants that was far more kind of meditative rather than the sort of more scientific aspects of hydroponics, which can be very technical. Um, and I just, I felt that this was a really important thing to address in terms of thinking about the climate crisis, which isn't so, something that we can address necessarily technically or logically or through a kind of purely scientific method or approach, but the problems that we face when thinking about um, climate, the climate changing um, are kind of major life challenges that are to do with these more kind of um, sensory um, perceptions and that it's as much to do with sort of emotional and spiritual kind of mental well-being um, uh, as a means to kind of think about the climate crisis and how we are kind of responding that um, it, it's just a kind of I wanted to kind of use all these different means and resources um, to kind of draw others into this sense of curiosity and concern that I think we all have for our kind of changing um, natural world. And so these are just some photographs of the ways in which that the plants have kind of um, sort of got to grips almost with the environment. So there's some really um, lovely ways in which that their, their tendrils sort of wrap themselves around uh, the wires or the plugs or the microphone stand. Um, here you can see again that the tendrils have wrapped themselves around and, and if you think about the time lapse you know there's a quite a long period of time that they that in which it takes for them to to kind of feel their way in these environments um, and then these are some pictures of the sage which is just kind of again a bit like the tomatoes has gone a bit um, feral in the studio kind of rewilding um, so finally, I just wanted to um, finish off the talk by talking about um, some of the future projects that I'm um, going to be looking at in the next six months. Um, so um, 
I'm delighted to say that we've been successful um, in applying for a grant and I'm going to be working with two um, engineers from Bristol Robotics Lab and also another artist, Rachel Nee, on a six month research project which is going to start next week. Um, so I'm going to be working with Drs. Hema Fillimore and Elliot Scott, who are engineers looking into building um, sensing apparatus that will sense the water nutrients um, in the water. And these are going to be powered by microbial fuel cells. So um, especially with a system like the large um, tomato um, system, the ebb and flow system, it's impossible really to get a sense of the, um, the water nutrients that are um, in the chamber below. Um, so the, the uh, robots um, that we're going to be um, developing are uh, modeled on uh, water boatmen. So they'll um, be powered by these um, fuel cells that take, um, that um, are powered from the from uh, waste material in the water itself. And they'll be able to um, monitor the uh, electroconductivity and the nutrient content and the pH levels in the water and be able to communicate that. So that's something that's um, that's really exciting. And um, working with artist Rachel Nee, we're going to consider how the data from these devices could be to, um, potentially translated into um, more kind of intuitive methods of understanding the data. So maybe potentially in the form of sounds or maybe in, in um, colors and um, lights that will um, be able to kind of feed back to people kind of what the conditions are that these plants are growing in. Um, and we're also going to be looking into the potential of robotic pollinators. Um, so one of the fundamental things that's arisen through this research is the systems are very good at growing leafy greens, um, particularly salad, um, vegetables or herbs, um, but not so much in terms of pollinating in order to get fruit. So um, I've grown, you know, this enormous um, sort of wild uh, tomato plants, but I've actually, um, oh, sorry, I'm just gonna, just grown the one tomato from this. So, um, and there's no, no cucumbers have fruited and no peppers, despite manually pollinating the flowers um, and also um, using fans to shake the, the stems. So if we're thinking about the climate crisis. This is obviously something that we need to think of on a much larger scale. Um, but um, obviously if we don't have bees and insects to pollinate the fruit, then the fruiting plants, then we, this might potentially be something that we have to think about on a much larger scale. But at least for now, we're kind of looking into that um, on this six month project. And, Additionally, what I want to do is um, consider some of the material resources of hydroponics. I mentioned earlier about plastics, um, but thinking about um, where some of these resources are, that are needed for the, for the growth of the plants are coming from. So potentially looking at things like where the fertilizers come from, but also things like this. So on the right hand side here um, is a sponge, um, Sort of pellet that is that they are sold with the um, off the shelf um, the hydroponic systems for use in the kitchens, but they're they're a they're a plastic sponge, um, and they look very although they look very similar to the peat pellets that you can see on the left. Um, it's essentially a non compostable um, material. So I'm really interested in um, where these materials how how we kind of how we can sort of deal with these materials because it's all very well kind of using hydroponics to address the climate crisis but if you're generating other um, kind of pollutants and not recycling the plastics um, then it's to me it, it's very kind of problematic um, so this these are some of the questions that I want to address um, also in terms of um, electricity, we need electricity to power um, these systems. So I know at the moment there's, um, there's quite a lot of press around the, the rising costs of um, fuel in the UK in particular, and um, this kind of increase in, in energy prices or, or potentially power cuts could mean that hydroponics isn't necessarily um, 
the answer that we need in terms of addressing um, addressing fresh food or or indeed kind of um, many of these sort of questions that are posed. Um, so one way in which I'm going to be um, looking at some of these questions, um, particularly around the kind of materials that are um, used in, in hydroponics and thinking about reusing materials, but also thinking about reusing uh, water such as grey water that's produced from um, produced in the home um, like it's, it's 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 water that we've that we've washed in or that we've washed up in washed our clothes in um, so I'm going to be working with um, artists Ella Good and Nikki Kent on their uh, Martian house project um, which will be built on Bristol Harborside uh, next year in 2022 and this is a project that uses the sort of analogy of the Martian house as a real um, it's a real architectural building, but it's a structure to frame ways in which we can possibly think about what it's like to live on, on Earth and in terms of the material resources that we're using um, and how we kind of can reflect upon those, but in the kind of analogy of a, of a Martian house. So I'm going to be working with them um, next year to, to kind of think about this as a framing device for hydroponics. Um, so yeah, um, working at different scales in the future, um, work on from that, um, I'm, I'm hopefully setting up a series of uh, workshops with um, school children in the next 12 months and potentially working at a much larger scale. Um, what I'd like to do is an establish like an open access hydro poetic uh, research station where I'd be able to invite guests and generate discussions both with scientists and agriculturists and roboticists, but also artists and host um, workshops in and for the community about um, the need and the urgency of growing fresh food in a climate, climate crisis. So thank you very much for um, attending this talk. And I'm very interested to um, hear your thoughts and potentially uh, any questions that you might have. Katie, thank you so much. Uh, I don't think I'm ever going to look at a cucumber in the same way as <laughs> all the blood. Um, it was beautiful seeing it move in that way. I think like it's a really interesting thing to see uh, time or in gardening observed in that way when it's often such a slow form uh, uh, and you don't see the movement um, manifest like that. Um, so uh, Q&A is ready, chuck us in some questions into the chat, tweet us at PTUK if you've got any questions and boom we've got our first one. <laughs> um, why do you think growing food using hydroponic systems hasn't become more widespread in people's homes? Um, I think there's, there's still a perception that it's kind of quite an odd thing to do, it's quite a strange thing to do. Um, certainly in the West, certainly in, in the UK. Um, I know that when I was first kind of sharing some of the, um, the leaves and the vegetables that I'd grown in the studio, um, I, grow, I grew quite a lot of spinach and a lot of rocket and was inviting other artists to come in and, and, and taste them. And they were a bit kind of, oh, is it going to be, a, is, it, is it going to glow in the dark? Are we, you know, is it? <laughs> I think people have got a very kind of, odd perception maybe of of how it's a bit freaky and um one of the things that i wanted to do was maybe kind of dispel a few of those myths or or maybe just kind of probe them a bit and um and see see how how real they are um i mean uh, there's uh, yeah i mean i i still have an allotment and try go there as much as possible there's something to be said about you know that kind of being outdoors in a space where you're growing food and the, the the smells that you get from watering plants but you there's you know the 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 strength and the fragrance that you also get from growing these hydroponically is 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 incomparable actually there's and some of the herbs are, are incredibly kind of um strong and the rocket was so peppery so i think maybe it's like just getting used to a new way of doing something um so that we can kind of have them as combination of different methods really 
And what's the kind of um, what's the science behind energy consumption? Because obviously, this the hydro, hydroponics gets talked about a lot in terms of climate change and possible kind of solution. But at the moment, it, re it relies quite heavily on electricity. So, what do you know? Yeah. Like the sense of like how that compares to kind of the slightly probably less refined and more energy consuming. I'm I'm, I'm guessing more energy consuming traditional farming methods we're used to. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. And these are some of the things that I really want to explore further because I find it highly problematic that we're kind of pushing it as a future means of farming food, but actually it's, it's heavily reliant on electricity. And one of the things that I would like to do um, in the project with the robotics lab is to experiment with um, more solar panels and thinking about, I mean, it seems like a backwards way to go, but to have a solar powered light that could um, give the, the the plants the kind of the red, the red and the blue um, frequencies that that they need more you know to to grow or to um, produce what they need in the leaves more efficiently. But um, this is something that yeah I don't have any answers yet, but um, it's something that I want to explore more in the future. Um, yeah, that, I, I think I think in this country because of the lack of light. It, it is quite a tricky um, scenario. I know that in um, obviously much hotter countries nearer the equator, there are hydroponic systems that, that you know are happy outdoors or in at least kind of greenhouses. They don't need the artificial um, lighting that we do in the north. So um, yeah, it remains to be seen really. Uh, okay, another question from the chat then. Um, how easy was it for you to get set up uh, in terms of equipment and getting started? And would you recommend anyone anything particular for beginners? Great. Um, it, I was a bit nervous and apprehensive to start with, um, but it was it was quite an easy thing to do. I was quite sort of pleasantly surprised. If you start with one of these kind of um, kitchen surface or tabletop kind of kits, it's a good sort of introductory way to um, learn the basics and um, certainly germinate the seeds and then you can move on to bigger systems if that's something that you think that you want to do. Um, I even think IKEA is selling these kind of systems now so um, or you can buy them um, John Lewis have them or like other online retailers um, but yeah, the, the one thing that I would say is that maybe the I didn't use the um, nutrients that came with the sort of package. They, they come all, all um, as an all-in-one package. Um, similarly, I don't like, like using the sponge for the same reason that I said it's, it's a plastic and I don't want to add more plastics into the environment if I can help it. But... Um, but yeah, there are um, there's online retailers that specialize in hydroponics and you can speak to somebody about getting um, better sort of uh, chemical fertilizers to to um, nourish the plant. So, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I was very fortunate actually to to have the residency. So I had a, a bursary from the watershed and residency and that enabled me to really I, I spent all of it on on just experimenting with different bits of kit um, and really in, in kind of investing in all of these setups so great uh, what is your ultimate plant to grow what's what's the one thing that you haven't grown yet that you would like to grow in hydroponics oh oh that's a good one um not sure actually something like leafy vegetables or leafy kind of cellar plants or herbs work really well I did try chamomile and that didn't work at all I don't know why but um things like spinach basil is amazing rocket um any kind of leafy sort of greens seem to work really well I'd like to get the things to fruit I think that's kind of I'm a bit disappointed about that um one little tomato is kind of oh um yeah especially like the peppers i think i'd really like to grow peppers and cucumbers but yeah so you're gonna have to flood your studio with bees yeah <laughs> <laughs> great well listen we'll join you live for that <laughs>
Katie, thank you so much for talking today. It's been really, really good to hear some more about uh, everything you've been doing on the Salem Residency. Um, before you all go, next week's talk is going to be announced uh, later, early next week, because some unforeseen circumstances have had to push Tiny Giants talk on NFTs back to a later date, but it will be happening. So in the meantime, you can get news on all our future talks by heading to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio, following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram or subscribing to our newsletter on our website. Don't forget, hit subscribe before you go and give us a thumbs up. The more likes we get, the more subscribers we get, the more we can share stories like this. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you all again here, same time, same place, next week.